when we're talking about cold and heat exposure, which is something that you've spent an awful lot of time thinking about, what's the best way to utilize cold and heat routine throughout a week? Like what's just the the simplest way to do an evidence-based cold and heat protocol? I think um, one of the best ways would be if you, so most people should be training, right? They should be doing some sort of resistance training or endurance training, uh, vigorous exercise. Doing the heat after that, I think, would be one of the best because you're you're extending your workout to some degree. So there's been there's been studies looking at the on the endurance side, like if you're uh, intervention studies that have taken people that have done exercise on a stationary bike, or they've done the same exercise in the stationary bike and then done. 15 minutes of a hot sauna, like right after that. Mm -hmm. and With basically no break. With no break. They just go into the sauna after. And then VO2 max was measured. So VO2 max is like your best way to measure cardiorespiratory fitness, right? So maximum amount of oxygen you're taking in and maximal, you know, exercise. So um, the their VO2 max was better in people that did that exercise, the, the stationary bike plus the sauna versus just the stationary bike, right? And that is a lot because sauna to some degree is mimicking moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise. You know, it's it's doing a lot of the same things, a lot of the same physiological responses happening. So I would say um, doing the sauna right after the workout, but also there's a new study that came out showing people that did resistance training and then got into a sauna had like better muscle gains. And it just makes your workout more of whatever you did. It makes you, it, you know, but I think some of that has to do with the heat shock proteins too. And um, also, yeah, there's been studies showing that if you um, increase blood flow, like like if you do resistance training, it used to be like this thing where it's like, oh, don't do any endurance training like like at this on the same day that you're doing resistance training because you're going to blunt your gains or something. I don't remember what it exactly was called, but that's kind of been put to rest. It's not true. Uh, so, so to, to, well, I guess there's always extreme, there's always outlier, I should say ways you could do it, but generally speaking, like getting some blood flow to your muscles after you've done training actually improves hypertrophy, right? Cause you're getting some growth factors and things there and immune cells, things that are like playing a role in the hypertrophy. Is right? there a window post training that you need to get into the heat within? Not necessarily. No. Within the no. same day? No, I think you should do it if you okay. You act, you asked me about the optimal protocol. Yep. I would say optimally it would be after training. Yep. It doesn't have to be because also heat plays a role in sleep. So pe some people choose to do their heat at night, like a couple hours before they're going to go to bed. You can go. I actually have been kind of obsessive about this of late, and I do both. So I do. I get in the sauna after I work out, and then I do the jacuzzi at night with my husband. Um, so, which is another form of heat stress. You're in, you know, 104 degree Fahrenheit water. You can be in there for 20 minutes and get similar responses in terms of biomarkers as a sauna. So I do think um, if you're only going to do one, you can kind of choose. Like, do you have a hard time sleeping? Do you want to or do you want to kind of extend your workout? And now I don't know that you have to do it. Like, I think there's also been observational data. By the way, the study with the cyclists and the sauna that was in untrained people, so you might go, oh, well, what about trained people? Gains, yeah. yeah. But then there's observational data showing that people that do exercise or people that exercise and sauna. So this is all sorts of people. This is These are people that are exercising. These aren't newbies, right? The people that do exercise and sauna have a higher VO2 max compared to people that only exercise. Mm. So there's evidence, I think, that that kind of makes it a little stronger, that it's not just a, a newbie gain, right? Like yep. that it's probably something going. And I think it's because it's, it's mimicking cardiovascular exercise. So do you have to do it after a workout? No, you don't have to. Uh, but I do think it's, I, I personally like to do it after a workout. It's like, I've already got my heart rate up, you know, it's, it's so it's really just like extending, extending my so the, workout. Some, the some two uh, windows that seem to be at least interesting to use would be two hours ish finishing two hours before bed. I say that, yeah, because some people take longer to cool down. Yeah, me and too. I do. Exactly. So yeah, two hours like to get out before, you yeah. know, like, because then you don't want to be like trying to go to sleep, then you'll have the opposite effect, right? You're too hot. You can't yeah. fall asleep. And then post-workout. So post-workout right. and a, a couple of hours before right. sleep. What temperature? How long per week? What else? 
Yeah. So um, temperature, duration, frequency, like how many times, you know, so there's all sorts of studies coming out of Finland where saunas are ubiquitous and everyone's using one looking at, you know, sauna use and all cause mortality, cardiovascular rate of mortality, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, all those things. Right. And what's clear is that there is a dose dependent effect with frequency and duration in the sauna. So in other words, the more frequent the sauna use, the more robust of the effect. So I'll give you an example. All-cause mortality is 40% lower in people that use the sauna four to seven times a week. So four times would be minimum, right? Versus people that use it two to three times a week, they have a 24% lower all-cause mortality, right? So the bare minimum would be two if you want something. Um, This is compared to people that use it one time a week. But if you want the most robust effects, the bare minimum would be four up to seven, right, every day. So that would be frequency. Now, temperature and duration, most of those studies in Finland, the average temperature in the publications is about 174, 175 degree Fahrenheit. And the duration in that sauna is also important. So if people only stayed in for 11 minutes, they weren't getting a very robust effect. They had to stay in for at least 20 minutes. Mm. So 20 minutes at 174 degree Fahrenheit four times a week is the recipe for, I would say, the the best, you know, uh, effects for cardiovascular, brain, all-cause mortality. What about if you increase temperature and reduce duration? Yeah, so this question, usually I get at the opposite because people are interested in infrared saunas, and infrared saunas go only to like 145 degree Fahrenheit. They mm-hmm. kind of heat you up a little differently. They're not, the ambient air is not as hot. It's like, you know, electrons that are like moving your molecules in your body up. But Mm. um, and so in that case, you would want to stay in a much longer duration. And that's what's used in like Ashley Mason study. But the opposite. So like if you're going to, you know, what, 180 or how how hot are we talking? Mine was 230 today. Okay, so um, heat is so heat is a stress. it's It's a stress on the body. Right. And you have this stress response to the heat, right? So your body makes heat shock proteins, for example. You get dark thoughts. You (laughs) you get dark thoughts. Yeah, exactly. And then then you get out and you feel great. But um, you also get chatty in there. So um, it's it's important to keep in mind that you don't want to go too extreme on heat because it is a stress. Like, just like you don't want to like, exercise like all day like you need recovery right you don't want to fast like forever like you need food these things are stressed they're stressors on the body and our body has a stress response to them so this is kind of like hormesis we talked about hormesis a lot right hot heat is the same thing um heat can permeabilize the blood brain barrier when you start to go to extreme temperatures melting my brain i'm concerned that that 230 is too high. Yeah. there's yeah. So there was one study that came um, that was published. Is it 2022? It was kind of recent-ish. And um, it wasn't from um, Dr. Yari Laukinen's group, who is the main researcher who does a lot of studies out of Finland uh, looking at, you know, sauna use and dementia, for example. He found sauna use is associated with like a 66% reduction in Alzheimer's disease and dementia if you're they're using it four to seven times a week. Well, another study came out, and this was in... Gosh, it was quite a few. I don't remember if it was two or 5,000 adults. It was a lot. Or maybe it was more, actually. Um, Well, anyways, they looked at temperature, and they looked at duration, and they looked at Alzheimer's disease risk. And, you know, it was clear that, you know, if you use the sauna, you had a lower degree, a lower risk of, of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. But there was a subset of group where people were using it at 200 degrees Fahrenheit or more that had the opposite effect. Wow. So you shaped curve to temperature. I think so. I don't talk about, I don't want people to get freaked out because it's like, but not everyone's doing 200. I think there's the extreme, there's always this extreme push where I'm going to go hard. And if you're that personality type, you're going to be that person that goes all the way because that's what you do on everything you do. Turn the dial up. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So um, I do think with sauna though, it's important to keep in mind that it is a pretty strong stress on the body, yep. particularly if you're not head out, right? But if you're getting your head in there and warming it up to 230 degrees yeah this plunge thing is 
really really intense i mean there's a couple of things when you think about like where's the thermometer actually located is right. it is it highest at, point it's, it's, it's at the top unless you're stood on your tiptoes on the bench you're not actually going to get your head to that point and the difference between this one that i've got is two benches and the lower bench is way cooler half half as hard as sitting on the upper bench and the upper bench isn't at the all the way at the top and if you're at the other side to where the rock heater thing is if you're over there then it's easier and if you're at the front then it's a bit hard so you can kind of mitigate within that i suppose um one consideration like four times a week can be quite intrusive for somebody to get that heat exposure especially if they don't even if you do have a sauna at home it's still pretty intrusive like i kind of gotta go back and forth to the thing and preheat it and all the rest of the stuff is there a or if you were to do 20 minutes in at 180 190 something like mm-hmm. that uh, to make sure that it's 174 yeah. Uh, and then take a little break and then go back in. Is that a way that you could maybe get away with doing three times a week or two times a week and still try and capture some of those really good gains? Um, I don't know that that data is there to make that statement, but I do know that there have been studies looking at going repeatedly and taking a few minutes break and going back into the sauna. And what is clear is that you do get big major boost in growth hormone. Is this the thing that 16 yeah, X increased? Yes. Tell, yes. tell us that. Yeah. So what they were doing is they were going, so they're going, I don't remember how many times, but it was quite- Four times 30 minutes with some, a break. Yeah, with break, something yep. like that. Yeah. So it's been years since I've talked about that study, but yeah. So um, and that that could give 16 fold increase in growth hormone, which, you know, it does. it's transient. It doesn't like last forever, but, you know, also growth hormones involved with sleep. And in deep sleep. And so it's it's another reason why doing that, like timing your sauna around around bedtime mm-hmm. could be highly beneficial for a lot of people. Like a lot of people really do benefit. So I personally, like I said, I do I kind of do both. I did like the I do the hot tub, um, which is 104 degrees, and I'm in there for like 30 minutes. And but the difference being that it's 104 degrees of liquid touching your exactly, skin. Exactly. You no. Know, and there's been studies that have looked at so there's heat shock proteins that are activated. Um, in the sauna, and they're also activated in the hot tub. And brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is from exercise, also is activated when you get in a hot tub. So, and and the sauna. So it's like you, when you start to see the biomarkers that are similar between the different heat modalities, you kind of go, "Well, at the end of the day, is your heart rate going up in the hot tub?" Yes. It's like mm-hmm. I've been I've done the sauna for like years and years and years and years. I like I know how I feel. I feel the exact same way in the sauna. I like the the sauna better because I'm less likely to cheat. Like I will cheat in a hot tub. I will get my arms out. Yeah. I will, yeah, like you yeah, have yeah. to have your shoulders down for twenty minutes. Mm-hmm. So you have to really. Didn't like, you? Uh, I saw you on Twitter get into a. You got in trouble with big steam, like the steam room versus uh, sauna versus jacuzzi thing. I think there's a lot of people that are like evangelists for the sauna being the only way to get hot. And I think that you'd mentioned there's quite a lot of different ways that you can get. There's hot. There's a lot of different ways you can get hot, and I think, I mean, I've done a lot of steam showers again you're getting your heart rate up you're you're getting you're increasing your uh, cardiac output you're getting blood flow increases you're sweating mm. like all these things are happening it's it's the heat shock response you're you know there's a lot of ways what is it the lot of roams to a lot of roads to rome yeah, right yeah, i mean yeah. it's not would uh if somebody doesn't have uh access to easy easy access to a sauna or doesn't have one in the house what about just running a hot bath and then continuing to like i I'm, i mean how much is a thermometer that you put in the bath it probably five dollars maybe ten dollars or something throw that in get it at what temperature and stay in for 20 minutes exactly i do this a lot when i'm traveling by the way like i get i do the um the portable sauna i do i do it um but so what i what i like to, to recommend is like so go and get one of those pool thermometers right i mean they're like you said they're like anywhere between five to fifteen the little floaty ones the little floaty ones you put that in your bathtub and you get it up to 104 set your timer for 20 minutes make your make sure your shoulders are down like submerged below and if the 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 temperature starts to go down just add some more hot water and that's that's it most most people have a bathtub and so i like that it can be accessible because that's another thing i get a lot of oh well i don't have a sauna I privilege can't. position yeah, yeah you know and yeah there's a lot of gyms but this isn't finland like we're you know everyone has a sauna you know so so i do realize that there's a limitation on the saunas and you might go well then why do i need to like do i need it 
you know, like I said, so there's the VO2 max, you know, that you're getting, you're getting even better than just exercise. Mm -hmm. Now there's people out there that are endurance athletes, like they're, I don't know, do they need it like for VO2 max? Probably not. But it also helps with disuse atrophy, muscle atrophy. Um, and those studies have been done. So they've done studies where they do like this, they immobilize a limb in people mm -hmm. for like a period of weeks and they did local heating in, in one study, but there's been a lot of animal studies doing sort of whole body heating. And it'll prevent disuse atrophy by like 40%. Mm -hmm. 